it's all about what are you going to bring to the table. Struggling a lot with dyslexia, I was always trying really hard to do okay. I definitely struggled with that a lot in terms of self-confidence because I really wanted to do well and I tried really hard, but it didn't come naturally. It wasn't easy for me. Don't overestimate capital versus sweat equity because sweat equity ends up being what builds a business. Ambition is just how can we provide the most value in the most efficient way? That's really what drives and excites me. Hannah, thank you so much for being here and a big welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. So for people who are just getting to know about you today, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Of course. So I was a student at the University of Bristol. I studied liberal arts and in my final year at university, I was beginning to do the whole kind of consultancy grad scheme. I felt as a student, you think you're going to go into banking, law or consulting. So I thought consulting was the route for me. Right. Started doing the application programs, absolutely hated it. And at that point, I decided to kind of give the idea that I was discussing with my housemate at the time a go. So as soon as I graduated, started running up business plans and then launched Hyber um, in 2019, just as I graduated. Can you take us back to where the idea came from? When I was a student, I think what really surprised me was just how stressful it was renting for the first time. Everyone, you have, you're have you in university for about three weeks and you have to already decide who you're going to live with. Yeah. And then you hope you befriend a super organized type that's just going to take care of the whole deal for you. <laughs> it's the first time dealing with thousands of pounds of money, trying to budget with your student loan and then trying to decide where you're going to live and who you're going to live with. So I found that an entirely a very stressful experience and I was really taken aback by the lack of support. Obviously the university has a million things going on, their pastoral support system can't deal with all of the mental health inquiries, let alone helping people rent for the first time. Yeah, yeah. And then it was such an old school process of us walking up and down the high street, talking to just traditional letting agents who really didn't understand the kind of student struggles and that really unique point of, oh my God, I've just been thrust into the adult world. How am I gonna cope after being spoon fed at school? throughout my kind of childhood. So I was really shocked that there was no brand that resonated with that kind of unique experience. And thinking about the student community as a whole, I was in part of a lot of student ambassador programs and was taken aback by how students, it's still first touch point as a consumer, such a valuable group. And when you can really mobilize students, yeah, like I did with Red Bull and I did with another student led magazine, you can get a lot out of them. And it's a really fun um, kind of community to be working with. So all of that put together, as well as just looking at how the student and landlord relationship was awful. Mm -hmm. Every year it entirely breaks down because there's a lack of trust, a lack of communication, and both sides expect the worst from each other. So there's a whole deal every year of the student and landlord or the student and agent kind of going into keyboard warrior disputes. And I just thought no one wants to, no one wants to go through that. It's not enjoyable for either party. So why wasn't someone kind of problem solving to improve that relationship? And that's really how the idea started uh, with my flatmate. I was just kind of spending all the our evenings um, talking about that gap in the market. You would already had considered getting a full-time job, didn't like the process, didn't like the assessment days. What was it like in that time when you realized your path was going to change, this idea of you working on a graduate scheme wasn't really going to be for you anymore? I think that it was quite a, a relief when I gave myself kind of permission to stop with the consultancy grad schemes. Um, to be honest, my my another one of my friends was doing a lot of the written assessments for me because a lot of them were math tests. Right. I'm very dyslexic, so I really struggled with the time constraints with all those assessments. So from the beginning, I just thought this is not a process for me. It doesn't feel like an environment that I'm going to excel in. So as soon as I let myself get really excited by this gap in the market, building a business concept. Uh, it was a huge relief. And I was I remember kind of exactly at that point in summer after I graduated, had some great time off with my friends and then started to think about, okay, when I get back from having a good time traveling off the university, I'm gonna give this my all. And I was so excited by that concept whereas when I thought about myself in a consultancy grad scheme I was terrified so I think that just gut feeling. Tell me about what happened after that when you sat down with your flatmate and you both decided to start working on this. So it was an interesting experience because he was doing his final year of medicine. Oh wow. So he was dealing with exams and you know one of the hardest degrees you could possibly study was also really wanting to get involved with the business so that was quite difficult for us to manage. 
And it was only a few months after we really started that we realized that it wasn't going to work. He'd been doing medicine for seven years and you can't just stop that. He felt you know, a duty to the NHS. So he decided to depart ways. And that was when I really started the journey by myself. Um, so that was quite difficult, but I don't think I would have started it without that initial support from him and having someone to bounce ideas off. So it was a really important part of the journey. I'm really interested to know a little bit about you up until this point because a lot of us have these ideas and we think oh wouldn't it be so great if this existed but then to actually go ahead and execute on these ideas it takes a whole new mindset if you had to think back to your contributing personality traits or experiences up to that point do you think there was anything that led you to really want to pursue it I think the kind of the answer to that is twofold. Firstly, I think there's a huge amount of naivety that's amazing. But when you start a business after university, because I had no idea what I was getting myself into. And if I knew what I was getting myself into, I probably wouldn't have done it. So I think it's a great sense of like adventure and not really understanding the stress and the consequences and what you're sort of getting yourself into. Whereas when you're trying to start a business, when you've been working for a few years and you're starting to think about a mortgage, you're starting to think about other responsibilities and you're already, you know, on a path, on a trajectory. Whereas I was starting from square one. A lot of my friends were still studying. A lot of my friends didn't know what to do. So it was just a, I'm already at the bottom of the food pile, whatever you're going to call it. So why not give this a go? So that was a much easier starting point. Um, and then in terms of personality traits, um, so I'm the youngest child of, so my sister is eight years older than me and my brother's nearly 10 years older than me. Mm -hmm. And then all my cousins are older than me. So I've always had that hunger to prove myself and always wanted to keep up with everyone else. Mm -hmm. So I think being part of a, a successful family when everyone's doing a lot really always made me want to show that I could kind of keep up. So I guess in a way, like what a way, an opportunity to prove myself and and keep up with the rest of the family. And yeah, I think that really, that gives you a kind of sense of drive and hunger. And your family members, are they involved in business as well? So they weren't, but actually now my sister-in-law has a business and her husband, who's my brother, also started a business. So now we've got, there's three entrepreneurs in the family. But to be fair, actually growing up, I did, my mom was um, involved in a startup in a, kind of management position in a startup and it failed it did, didn't do great but yeah it was it was tough to kind of a tough journey mm -hmm. but I think growing up being involved with that um probably influenced me in a way that I haven't really addressed so it was probably great to see that kind of startup mm -hmm. um experience even though it didn't work mm -hmm. like what a cool thing to be a part of I understand that you got your first taste into like real management and leadership during lockdown am I right in saying that yeah because you had five siloed staff members that came on board, which is amazing for any startup. But at the same time, it is a bit like being thrown into the deep end if you hadn't done something like that before. So what was that experience like for you? Starting a business and then immediately going into lockdown, um, I think it really, in a way, allowed me to work at a, a slower pace, although I was working all day every day and that was great because there's no distractions. But it meant that I wasn't, there was an expectation that businesses were slowing down and I didn't have to immediately hire a really big team and think about raising, et cetera. I could really spend time getting to know the student community in Bristol, getting to know our landlords really well, building those really strong relationships oh, that's good. and really understanding the problem that I was going to be solving for and doing everything that didn't scale so that at the point when I wanted to start scaling the platform, I knew exactly how to automate the value that we'd provided in a more manual one-to-one -one basis. Mm -hmm. So it was a really good way for, yeah, made me to kind of slow down the the hybrid journey. Um, but to answer your question, yeah, the furloughed staff, that was great. There was an initiative with work and startups where they spotted an opportunity of, you have all these really talented people who've been furloughed, who are probably working in industries that they don't enjoy that much, but they've just been on that train of, you know, go, 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 go. Now is a chance for them to actually see, well, do I want to gain creative skills that maybe I want to actually be a content writer, et cetera. So I want to write blogs, but they've been doing sales for the last five years. Right. So it was a really good opportunity to give furloughed staff the chance to work in startups and gain experience at, from entirely different industries to get to explore if they would want to be doing something else. 
And then also because people were really bored as well, they wanted something to do and further, you know, develop skills, etc. And then you have all these startups that really, really need support, but didn't have the financial backing, couldn't access a lot of money, um, external investment, etc. So it was such a good opportunity to match the two together. And yeah, I ended up working with um, five different people and kind of organizing like team meetings, thinking about culture. And it was a really good first um, step to growing a team and learning how to do that. And what did you learn when it came to implementing a culture within Hyper? A literal step-by-step guide of meeting structures. Like, how do I want to do meetings? Is it every day stand-ups? Is it just once a week? Is it three times a week? How much, like, especially working in online that was a great learning for me and now I have a tech team that is fully abroad yeah so like how do you create a culture when you're not in person how do you want to structure the check-in so it's not overbearing but and you feel like you actually have a relationship with people and you can be there to support people how do I want to grow the team like what are the departments I'm going to have in our hive is it you know loads of people in marketing or is the whole team going to be in customer success or is it all going to be a tech team like just thinking through who you wanted the team, what talent you wanted the team, who are the personalities that met, um, that are, you want to kind of build the culture with. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, so many learnings. Were there any skills that you had to develop or something within your mindset quite quickly to take on that role of being a manager of five people? That's a really interesting question. I think what I found, what I found from the last three years is it's just it gives you a huge amount of self-confidence and I think that you just have to have a lot of self-belief and it's a really fine balance of being confident in your decisions be able to make decisions quite quickly and feel feel assured and be able to kind of lead a team and tell them this is the direction that we want everyone to go in and unite everyone around the objectives and the direction whilst also being really humble and open to feedback all the time and willing to learn from everyone around me that's done this already right and so being it's like really fine balance of like admitting that you know nothing and that speaking to as many entrepreneurs as I could possibly speak to over lockdown messaging everyone on LinkedIn they'd love to like hear about your learnings what would you have done differently absorbing as much as I could whilst also having the self-confidence to lead and drive a team forward so I think it's that really fine balance of having the two sides and yeah, and getting that right. Being the founder, you've got nobody above you in the hierarchical structure. So to get that feedback from people, was that quite important to you? Definitely. And so I did a lot of um, pitching during the kind of first year. So in terms of like the journey and break it down into the first 12 months was when it was just a one man band. I mean, just working with some further staff, but really understanding the community and doing a lot of entrepreneurial pitches. Mm-hmm. And then the second year was kind of breaking even hiring two or three people building up to my first raise and then the last year has been doing the raise and really actually bringing on senior people having a team of 14 scaling and trying to starting to scale the platform so for the first year it was amazing to as involved in the new enterprise competition it's a natwest pitching competition montague evans competition probably quite a few other ones that i applied to yeah. and i found that really helpful because it was grant um, grant applications, so having to write out my business plan, having to answer questions around the direction of the business, and then pitching, always pitching online or in, in person, but online, so live pitching. And getting direct feedback from judges. And it was so interesting for me to hear where they thought there were gaps in, in, in the solution. You know, what were their pushbacks? What were their hesitations? What were they concerned about? Um, what did they compare us to? Um, and I loved that whole process. And I think it was a really great opportunity for me to really create really robust foundations for Hyber. It's almost like getting mentorship feedback in yeah. some way. You're going there to pitch something and, and get something out of it. But then you're also getting all this useful information that you can then apply directly to your business. Exactly. It's, yeah, it's great for learnings. It's great for press. It's great for as well as funding so it's I would recommend anyone starting a business to go down that route because you might a lot of people are put off I mean they realize actually there's not that many legs they don't have legs to the business or actually it's flogging a dead horse or you know it's a really good process to go through because you quite quickly realize 
is the space too competitive? Is there too much kind of concern for what you're building for? And you can pivot during that whole process. Was there ever a time when you were a bit worried about putting yourself out there? Potentially, if I was building something that to begin with, with was entirely novel, like potentially if it was really like deep tech and it was something that was super innovative. But what I began building was literally a platform to support students for their journey of first time renting. So just holding their hands to help them connect them to the right landlord um, with the right property for them and their friends, whether that's short-term, long-term tenancies, um, whether that is a private studio or a large house to share with friends and helping them understand what's the right property fit and, and match them to the right home and make sure they had everything they need in that process. And it's a kind of concept where everyone goes, surely that already exists. So because it was so, oh, that must already exist, there was no, I didn't have as much concern around, you know, it being a secret. I was really intrigued just to sit here with whether people had heard of something that I potentially couldn't find online or what they really thought about the business. Um, I also am a Guy Raz fanatic, the, the how I built this podcast and on all the founders that go on that, they always talk about how building in stealth mode, it doesn't help anyone. As soon as you have an idea, get feedback from everyone and anyone that you can possibly get feedback from because that's the only way that you'll really learn and you'll be able to take on that feedback and adapt the product. So I really had that in the back of my mind as well. Don't get me wrong, it was also really, really tough. Like, <laughs> like I, I'm saying that, but I, every time I got negative feedback, even today, I, it's always a kick in the stomach. It always really hurts and takes like a couple hours or a couple of like a day or two to recover from it. So it's, although it's great and I'm this huge part of you know, what I want to continue relying on as we go, it still really hurts when you get any negative feedback. Yeah. If I was to talk to you about ambition, what would that mean to you? Great question. I say ambition to me means trying to be the best that you can be in your field and building the best solution for all of your kind of key customers. So it's really just about excelling for me in terms of I don't feel feel like I ever feel satisfied unless Hyba is the product that myself and our team know it can be. And that is this matchmaking platform where a student can go on, give their rental criteria and be automatically matched up with the building that will have a high chance of accepting them. So every landlord has many buildings in their portfolio, many homes, and every home will have a specific criteria of a tenant that they're looking for that they have a high chance of accepting. And it's enabling that matchmaking in a really smooth, slick way and the onboarding process that not even any of the big portals have managed to solve for. So it's a huge mission around making that a much smoother process as well as it being a really unique experience to the student renter who doesn't know what deposit and guarantor is, who really needs that support throughout those pro that process. And then we, t we kind of problem solve for the risk assessment model, which is there's no way to assess risk in the student market. If you are an international student, you have to pay 12 months rent in advance. That is very, very unfair for most international students who don't have not in the 1% of the population. Mm -hmm. And then you have students in the UK who come from low income backgrounds. And if they don't have parents earning 30 times the monthly rent, then they can't rent in the UK. So it's a very unjust um, system that favors the elite as in most um, industries do. So there's so much that we can do around make, creating a fairer system where students can rent based on their own merit. How, how good are you at communicating with your landlord? Do you give all the key documents on time? How can you explain that you're gonna pay your rent because you have a grant funding or you have a student loan plan and you're a part-time job? It should be based on you as an individual, not yeah. on the families that you come from. So that's really like this, it's such a big mission. And that's, for me, ambition is just building that. And then along that journey, we'll find so many more other problems to solve for because everyone's entirely for forgotten about the student renter and building and problem solving for the student renter or even the young professional who's, rent who's renting for the first time with a, with a job and all the anxieties that come with that. Mm -hmm. So there's just, for me, ambition is just how can we provide the most value in the most efficient way. Um, and yeah, that's really what drives and excites me. Mm -hmm.
We touched on resilience a little earlier in this conversation, and you mentioned that you experienced dyslexia when you were younger. So do you feel that that in any way impacted your resilience and has helped you on your journey now? I think um probably does in terms of the need to prove yourself. I really struggled at school until GCSEs when I did I did well for the school I was in and then I was moved to another school and I was suddenly at the bottom of the food chain again. I my exact my results were <clears throat> below average. And so there was constantly that whole and up until the end of my school experience. I was always trying really hard to do okay. I, I guess it gave me resilience, although I really, I definitely struggled with that a lot in terms of self-confidence because I really wanted to do well and I tried really hard, but it didn't come naturally. It wasn't easy for me. And then when it came to my final year exams, I think I wouldn't have started Hyper had I not done really well in my A-levels. So I went from doing kind of okay at school, really working really hard, struggling a lot with dyslexia, being very behind the class growing up at a younger age, um, always needing loads of extra support mm -hmm. um, and a lot of frustration from teachers who just didn't understand dyslexia mm -hmm. and were like, why can't you still read a clock? You know, why are you not getting your basic timetables? So that kind of really knocks your confidence at, the, at a young age. And then in the end of sixth form, I did one of the best in my year. I got full A stars, well, three A stars and an A. And it was really surprised. So my predicted grades were way lower. I would try, I didn't get into my university degree because my teachers gave me a below, like not the predicted grades that I needed. And I begged all my teachers and they were just like, no, we don't think you can do it. Mm -hmm. So I didn't get into my university that I wanted to. I didn't get to University of Bristol for liberal arts because I needed three A stars uh, predictions. And so then we're doing much better than I was predicted getting into the university and getting the the course that I wanted because liberal arts was a new course in the UK um that really gave me a huge confidence booster and it really showed that actually like all that hard work and work putting myself um, committing myself to something I could do it and I think just proving to yourself at a young age that if you work hard at something that you can actually achieve it that probably set me on another kind of court direction and then I got a first from my degree at university as well. So I think those little, yeah, I mean, looking back now, A-level results and university degree does not impact anything. But what it does impact is your confidence and the way you view yourself and what you think you can achieve. So I think that gave me a kind of huge amount of resilience, but also self-belief that I don't think I would have started high, but had those two events not happened. We've talked about the different phases of your business. So when you started and you were really hands-on, it was all hustling essentially, to now where you're thinking about things in terms of expanding your team, getting more senior people in. What is your experience when it comes to the different phases of business? I think people who are looking to start their own business would find that really useful. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So... The first year, so literally breaking it out from November 2019 to November 2020 yeah. was, I guess you could call it like market research. I was basically generating revenue, like work, invoicing clients from the first month we launched the business. But, you know, we're talking a couple hundred pounds a month in revenue. But it was really important for me to kind of get straight stuck into it so I could start learning from day one. Um, I much prefer the just, you know, build something, like spend a couple of days on it, mm -hmm. launch it and learn. And the, someone, something that someone said to me, which is, if you're not embarrassed by the first product that you launch and you launch too late. So it was really important for me just to get it out there and learn. So the first year was entrepreneurial competitions and just market research. Then year two was hiring the first kind of two people on the team. Um, learning a lot through that process and um, continuing to win a, bit, a few more entrepreneurial grants um, and starting to kind of prep for the first raise. So the end of year two, um, we raised, I started raising the pre-seed round and then hiring a couple more people to join the team. And then at the beginning of this year was the, 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 um, the first proper year of operation, I would say. So this year is the first year we had 14 people in the team and we were really thinking, okay, 
let's build the foundations of a tech platform. Yeah. Um, let's start before we did everything that doesn't scale. And now let's automate that value that we've been providing on a more manual one-to-one -one basis. So this year has been an insane amount of learnings. And now we're gearing up to, okay, let's nail two cities, um, show that we can nail a, a smaller a regional city like Bristol. If we can do Bristol, we can do Liverpool, Lancaster, Nottingham. Yeah. And if we can do London, then we can do Berlin, New York, et cetera. So really showing the investors that we can nail two cities, achieve product market fit, which is market share for us. So how much of the market share can we capture? How many of the lettings that happen in each city every year can we capture? 10% mm -hmm. of the market is amazing um, for this early stage. And then going out to raise our seed round. <clears throat> so I think what's been really important for me is always trying to be a bit further than you would need to be for the, um, for where your business is at for each round, if that makes sense. So okay, saying that. Some people raise pre-seeds with an idea and I would not be comfortable doing that. I don't wouldn't want to bring on external investor money unless I've really proved to myself and to everyone that I can do this. So I wanted to be generating revenue. I wanted to already have a lot of traction, show that we built a love product, show that we could kind of launch in other cities. So I was really trying to go above and beyond of where we needed to be in terms of traction to make it as easy as possible for me to raise that early stage round. It's so interesting to hear you talk while looking back at those three different phases. How much of that do you think you strategized at the beginning? Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. Watching my brother, um, who's 34 and only 35, start a business uh, now it's entirely different going into it with many years of experience re the startup ecosystem, spending, you know, months before planning and hiring the team in advance in terms of thinking about each kind of person, the ideal person, each role. Whereas for me, it was a real step-by-step -step learning as I go, well, we need this. Okay. Then we hire that person. Um, so it was not, I really couldn't predict what would have happened in the next couple of years, but it was just What's the business need right now? What do we need to do to achieve that one objective that we're focused on for right now? And then just learn as you go. When it comes to giving advice to people who are looking to move successfully from one phase to the other in their business, is there anything that you would say to them? I would say that team is everything. And the last quarter we've excelled because we've really doubled down on internal processes transparency between teams, really clear company objectives and individual objectives using the OKR model mm -hmm. for the, t the company and the, the kind of senior leaders to make sure that everyone's objectives align with the company's objectives and directly contribute to the company objectives and just having so many more check-ins all around those objectives. So there's always kind of three key objectives for each quarter that everyone is aligned to achieving. Mm -hmm. And that kind of clarity and focus has helped tremendously and it really helps you hire the right people who can double down and, and focus on that strategy. Um, so I think that's just been a complete game changer. I think one thing that I've realized has been really helpful for me so far is there's so many, when you're building, building Hiber to date, what's really helped every few months is a big part of my, uh, my story is so many competitions. But today we're still doing the best student accommodation platform, um, voted best startup in the Southwest. I was up for the Young Entrepreneur of the Year in London. And all of these little things, although they mean nothing and they are entirely superficial in terms of, you know, your business can still fail, et cetera. They shouldn't be, you shouldn't exaggerate their meaning. But what's important about them is morale. And when you're in the startup phase, morale is everything and really hyping up the team and also giving, stopping to give yourself a pat on the back and say, actually, the hard work is being recognized. And it's really hard to get that recognition at the beginning stage when you are, you know, on the mission for product market fit, you know, really kind of head down, working to show that there's, you're building a huge amount of value and that you can scale and grow the business to a multi-billion billion pound business. And until you do that, you feel like you haven't you haven't achieved anything. So having those 
applying for those awards and having those small wins and stopping to celebrate those small wins have been really, really impactful for me and the team in the journey so far. And so I think it's just about finding your own way of stopping and celebrating. Something that we like to talk about on this podcast is being open about some of the things that we don't know or haven't known in our journey. You've revealed a lot about the things that you've learned along the way. But if you could talk about one thing that you really didn't know at the start of your journey, but has helped you that you do know now looking back, what would that be? Most difficult part of the journey so far would, was probably raising the pre-seed for the first time. Okay. And I went into that without really, without kind of speaking to anyone, without really understanding what I was getting myself into. So I thought I could raise just under a million pounds in two months. I had no idea and I really pushed myself to my limits in those two months um, because, and then I spoke to other people afterwards and realized it takes six months. Like normally it could take longer to close such a big round. And I really, there was a huge amount of learnings that came out of that. And I probably pushed myself too close to burnout during that phase. Um, and I think, yeah, I think just speaking to as many different startup founders who are at the same stage as you or just a stage above okay. has been hugely helpful in terms of learning about, especially if they're in a similar industry to you, in terms of just being able to lean on them for the day-to-day -day struggles of, you know, being, feeling quite lonely, leading a team, yeah, you know, learning about the best way to speak to different investors, the best way to raise. Um, there's such a technical process. You could do a whole MBA just on that process and having to do the MBA whilst also building a, pro a, a team, whilst also building a company is a huge amount to take on. Um, so I think, yeah, I would just, if I could do anything again, I think I would spend more time allowing, investing in myself potentially, allowing myself time to learn about all of the different, you know, the way to raise, um, learn, spend more time speaking to more um, founders mm -hmm. um, so I could be more prepared going into each of these kind of key um, phases of, of growing a business. So that's a really interesting point because obviously as, an, as a founder, as an entrepreneur, you're so stretched over all these different areas. How do you find the time to continue to grow in yourself as an individual and entrepreneur? I think that's a really good question. I think, to be honest, it because of the time constraints, it happens on the job. But I think it's really important for me to have you know people and family and friends so that you can rely on, that you can speak to about everything that's going on and you can kind of use that as therapy sessions in a way because you can just use that as time to reflect on, you know, stopping yourself every time something happens with the team to think, is this, am I reacting emotionally? Is this rational? You know, what, have I misunderstood something? And just trying to be a lot more open in terms of feedback. So I read a book called Radical Candor this year okay. and it's amazing. It's all about being the fine balance of being empathetic, but also about being really um, honest um, and direct with your honesty and how that is ultimately being the most empathetic you can be is by being super honest with someone. And it's about how in traditional businesses, when you do six and 12 month reviews, if you were having a fight with a friend and you didn't tell them you something was wrong until six months later, then you cause so many more problems. So why would you do that in the business context? So it's about allowing everyone in the team to have really open conversations all the time or as, as frequently as possible so that you don't need to have everything in one go in a yeah. kind of big review. And, and I that can feel like a lot more daunting on an individual, couldn't it? Exactly. And actually just by treating everyone as human and finding out like why they've been kind of acting in a certain way and being a lot more honest with your approach, and more direct actually helps so much more in terms of rather than letting things build up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And having conversations, particularly ones that are difficult with your team, is that something that you had to learn how to do or was it something that you felt came quite natural to you? I thought that, you know, leading, uh, like managing a team would be one of the easiest things because I'm, I feel like I'm a people's person and I love dealing with people. It's definitely one of my favorite things of, of the role, but yeah, it's been a huge amount of learnings that in itself. I think a lot of the business books I read before was, it didn't resonate with me because they were just a lot more kind of harsh and a bit more business comes over anything, whereas that doesn't 
fit into how I like to operate. So I think being freed up to be able to be actually be a bit more emotional and actually speak to people and build more personal relationships, um, that approach works a lot better for me. So I think, yeah, I think that has allowed me to to actually feel like I can build those more personal relationships, but potentially I thought you weren't able to do in a business context. I think you've touched on a really interesting point there as well, because by doing that, essentially you've created a business thinking more about yourself and about your personality involved. And I think that's quite a freeing thought for a lot of people because there are so many particular ways that people might think when it comes to business success and and what that looks like and how one has to be and operate in those types of environments. But really, if it doesn't necessarily suit you, you have the freedom to choose that for yourself and choose how you want that to be in your own team. When it comes to something that you don't necessarily know now that you want to work on to help you for phase four of your business, would you be willing to get a bit vulnerable and share with us what that might be? Definitely. I think looking ahead um, to the next year, I think it's going to be really important for for me to let go of the day-to-day of the business a bit more and focus my energy and time more on the things that really matter. And I think all of the kind of work putting those processes in place has been a really good kind of, again, foundation to be able to do that. But I think it's a very common kind of first time found the issue of slightly micromanaging a bit too much and being a bit too involved in your teams every day and wanting to be do- things to be done at the standard that you were doing them previously when everyone works slightly differently and it can then come across to everyone else that you don't have trust in the team when that's entirely not the case. It's just, you, you end up being quite protective of your, your baby. I think I really want to focus on stepping back more and really be able to think where I can provide the most value to the business. And that will be on, you know, the new business side of things, on the raise and growing the team even more and putting all these processes in place. But I think it's going to be really important to, to let go. And it's really easy to think that you're not micromanaging and, and that you have, but I think it's something to con- continuously work on. Okay, so we're at this point in the podcast where we have a question from a listener. They've said, me and my two flatmates are in the beginning stages of starting a business. We have all promised to put in the same amount of money and we are equally passionate about this new venture. However, we are all working at the same time and we have different time commitments for the business, which means some of us are going to have a higher workload than others. If this is a success, we all want to leave our jobs in the future. But my concern is that if we can't all put in the same amount of time in the beginning stages, we run the risk of never getting to a point of success. Also, if we do become successful and it's down to one or two of us, then it would feel a bit unfair on the person or people who have spent more time working on the business please keep anonymous <clears throat> i think when it comes firstly down to who do you want to start a business with i'd say the most important attribute to have in common is are you able to give the same amount of time do you have the same work ethic and can you commit the same amount of time and money i think it has to be really clearly defined for example recently watching the spotify hit documentary on netflix and what what's great about their story is you have one person who's providing all of the money and you have one person that's providing the kind of brains and and time um not that's massively simplifying it but just to give an example if you can set that out really clearly then you know one person is the capital and one person is a sweat equity so they're giving their time then i think you can create a quite good business with that if you're really setting out the expectations but i would detail it to the point of how much and the hours you're giving a week both per people so it's you're not keeping to that there's no questions not but how much I like you it's what are your hours this week doesn't meet the expectations you have to take out especially with best friends you have to take out anything that could be personal if this is what we've laid out in really clear terms you either do it or you don't you either excel and you give even more hours or you're underperforming So you have to be so clear cut with that. And then it comes down to work ethic because I know a lot of amazing, talented friends of my life that are gonna go on to do amazing things but I wouldn't wanna start a business with because I know for me that I would feel, I'd hold a grudge um, because I would feel like I'd be giving so much of my time and energy and because they don't have the same work ethic, 
they would be clocking off at 6 p.m. every day. And that will end up be leading in a breakdown in your, not only your business, but your friendship. And that's not worth doing. And I, it's such an interesting stat. I think it's the number two reason, um, most common reason for businesses failing is either running out of funding or founder relationships breaking down. So it's such an important thing to consider. And everyone kind of says, you know, solo founder, you know, why don't you want to do it with someone else? And I, and I do kind of see the huge benefits of having someone that you're, you know, going into war with and having that person to support. It's definitely a really lonely affair with a solo founder, but I think it's so difficult to find the right match of the person that you should be going into build a, a business with. And that's why the most successful businesses are often run by someone who has the technical skill set. So they'll be running, be the CTO, they'll be running the technical side of the business, the growing the tech and product team. And you have someone who's the business side of it, they'll be running the sales and the marketing customer success. So you have a clear division in terms of roles and also what you can bring to the table, but you're both giving the same amount of time and often the same amount of capital. And you've managed those expectations at the beginning. I, I guess that's why this person is feeling the way they are because they probably haven't had those conversations. Yeah, and it's really hard to do. And especially, uh, you know, you're tiptoeing around someone's feelings, but for the sake of the longevity of your friendship, having a contract in place where you literally think about everything possible and you've got it written that down, and then you divide up the equity um, of the business, depending on the commitment that you can both put in and don't overestimate capital versus sweat equity mm -hmm. because sweat equity ends up being what builds a business. Mm -hmm. You can raise external investment. You don't necessarily need to have your own capital. It's all about what are you going to bring to the table. For people who want to know more about Hybra and want to know more about you, where can they find you on social? Yes, well, if you are a student or you have a family friend or relative that's a student and they're looking for um, support renting, it could be a question about your landlord or you're about to go to university and you don't know um, how to even approach renting for the first time or need help finding a house, then please uh, go to www.hybr.co.uk, hybr.co.uk, um, and the team would love to help. You can go on there, access blogs, um, content around renting, answering all those common questions, and you can also go and filter and find um, your dream home. And then any questions um, for me, if you want to get involved in Hiber and our ambassador program and you're interested in a role, then please reach out to me on LinkedIn. Uh, my name is Hannah Shapat and I'd love to hear from you. Or if you just have any ideas around how you would like us to solve for this problem in terms of matching students to their dream homes uh, in a much slicker way, then we'd love to speak to you. Here to change the face of the, the world of student renting as we know it. Thank you. Thanks very much for being here. Thank you so much for having me.